Um, so, um, you know, first of all, thanks very much for making the time. We really appreciate it. Um, it's, oh, it's, I'm, I'm happy to do it. That's great. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 uh, you know, if I may, I'll kind of just, I'll start it with a quick introduction for Earth to Org, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go straight into the questions. I, I know we've started a little late, but um, how are you, uh, or, or what's your next stop? Because do I need to finish I, my 12 or? No, I'm, I'm, I'm open-ended. Okay, excellent, so. great. Okay, well, um, thanks very much. Okay, wonderful. So I'll sort of start for proper. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. A quick introduction to Earth.org. Earth.org is a not-for-profit environmental organization based in Hong Kong. Our aim is to bring attention to what is happening to natural ecosystems worldwide. We advocate for sustainable economic policies for the protection of the, of the natural environment and an extension of governance or oversight to cover the global commons. With Earth to Org talks, we are engaging with inspiring change makers and thought leaders to share our share their opinion and knowledge with our global audience, all to bring attention to what we humans are doing to our planet. For the audience, I would like to welcome Jonathan Salk. Jonathan is a highly respected psychiatrist, a senior fellow of the Design Futures Council, and is a member of the advisory board of the Population Media Center. And Jonathan is also Jonas Salk's youngest son. The most recent book is, in fact, the new edition of A New, Rea a new Reality, Human Evolution for a Sustainable Future, which originally you co-authored with your father with a slightly different title. Correct, correct. You originally co-authored the book in 1981. Why did you decide to update it and re-release it today? Well, it, it's interesting. What after my father died in 1995, um, and these ideas kind of fell on, under the back burner somewhat. And but as time went by, I really began noticing that things that we had predicted or things that we had hoped to happen were coming to pass. Yeah. And we were seeing an increase in kind of integrative thinking, um, an increase in in changing our models to to be more future oriented. And I was approached by a young architect who found the book and David Duane, and he proposed that we republish it um, a few years ago and redesign it. Um, and we did, um, we found a wonderful graphic designer. We redid it, we, we, we updated it um, and just felt like there was now an audience for it that hadn't, hadn't been there before. Yeah, it, it was amazing to read the, the the insights into the future of humanity and 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 a new reality is is, is kind of sets forward a powerful vision capturing the state of human human evolution really incredibly elegantly around a kind mm. of core, core theme of the of the mathematical curve mm -hmm. yeah which is um yes it, the the core there's a core theme of a of an s-shaped curve which is a a growth curve that um, is seen in na nature and is seen is showing up in our human population growth curve. We've had a long period of rapid acceleration and really explosion of human population. And just within the last 25 or 30 years, we're seeing a slowing of population growth. And if, if UN projections are correct, we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll see a slowing and reaching an equilibrium by the end of the century um, at around 10 to 12 billion people. So that's that's quite a quite a change absolutely i, I think it's 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 obviously planet transforming change uh that, that uh -huh. we're, we're going through uh you, i mean on on that point of population I, I wondered when i read the book that your your father you know first part of his career was working on uh, in the medicine on, on vaccines and on on uh if in particular on developing the first effective polio vaccine do you think that this connection to saving lives may have also Sort of drawn him towards thinking more deeply about the population question. I, absolutely, okay. um, he throughout his life, even after the polio vaccine, he was really dedicated toward the alleviation of human suffering and toward um, human health and and flourishing even um, in all realms. And he often asked himself, as he throughout the last part of his life why can't we do the same thing for the social ills and for the ecological ills that we're facing that we did for the polio vaccine? We as human beings have the capacity to solve amazingly complex problems. And, um, 
he he was in, he he began to turn his attention attention to the human realm, not just the the medical or the bio realm, and and to encourage us and to to look to what can happen so that we can solve some of the, the big problems like poverty, like ecological destruction. Um, so yeah, yeah. he was a, a doctor foremost, first and foremost, somewhat for the planet after, toward the end of his life. Right, amazing to have two, two such significant parts of, of his career and life. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it does seem that so many of, of Earth's systems are poorly designed uh, and, and could, could benefit from, from uh, you know, better application of, of determined effort to, to improve those designs, whether it's on you know, the regulatory frameworks or our governance structures or these you know, wide gaps in, in effectively no governance when, when we discuss the commons that, that you know, uh -huh. clearly now need to be addressed. Whereas previously, I suppose they were on the slightly on the back burner while everyone you know, busied themselves with, with pursuing wealth and, and power. That's absolutely right. And I think the, the contribution of the book and the contribution my father brought was to look at, at our current period of time as there has been a longstanding upsweep in the, in the, uh, in the growth curve. And, and there'll be a, a downturn side as population slows. And he distinguished two eras, one he called Epic A and one he called Epic B. Epic A is the period we're just leaving, which as you described, was a time of acquisition, of growth, explosive growth, not paying attention to, to limits on resources or limits on waste. And um, also dominated by independence, competition, um, and imbalance in, in, in the distribution of wealth. And what we're, what we're seeing is a transition to a time when growth is slowing. And in that period of time, a whole different set of values and a whole different set of strategies are needed for human survival. Um, more integrative thinking, more cooperation, more holistic approach. And we're right at the transition point between those two different ways of looking at the world. Yeah, and, and it's up, up to us which direction we go. I, I, what, what do you think are the, are the greatest risks that face humanity today? Have, have these risks in your view, kind of evolved in the public eye to become universally recognized existential threats. So is there a shift as well in, in, in general population's perception of these risks? I, 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 it's, a, it's a little complex to describe. I think there is, there's definitely a shift. Mm. Um, but what we're seeing is we've kind of reached a point of inflection and the, and the future is uncertain. And we're seeing um, a group of people who are looking forward and saying, Yes, we need to change our paradigms. We need to change our approach. And th there's an existential threat and we need to make these adaptations in order to survive. Um, but there's a group of people faced with uncertainty who are saying, wait a minute, I don't know what's happening. Things are changing. I wanna go back to the values that got us here. I wanna go back to the strategies that were appropriate in the past and they're clinging to them very strongly. So that's why we have a, a real polarity between a, a group of people, you know, humans who are looking forward to the future and saying, we just need to change and adapt our strategies. And uh, basically uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people who are not buying into that and saying, we have to go back to isolationism, we have to go back to competition, we have to go back to, to looking after our, ourselves and selfishly. Yeah. The, so there's the, a, the, I'm the, just gonna say so, that kind of explains why we're in such a, a period of conflict and such, such a period of polarization, because we were sort of divided into those two camps. Yeah, I, I think when I read this part, I, I was you know, very much thinking about all the institutional um, momentum or, or lack of momentum, almost like a dead weight or, or a clamp that, that's holding us back. And, and you know, whether that be uh -huh. gov governance, gov governmental institutions or military industrial complex that is kind of very motivated with the old ways of doing things that not only are acting as a drag and perhaps a, a spoiler of some of this movement for change, but are, but are kind of in some ways actively trying to keep political leadership you know, going in one direction, even though the population is perhaps very much shifting in the other direction. Yeah, I think that that's, that that's absolutely right. And that's, um, 
that's definitely a momentum killer, as, as it were. Um, and what we're, what we're also faced with in terms of institutions is we currently have institutions and systems that were developed to be appropriate for a, a, a world that was growing and a world that was competing and a world that was, was, was operating with different parts independently and acquiring as much as you could for yourself. Those systems um, are basically obsolete and not going to be working for the future. But we're we're in the process of we we are in the process of having to design and to look at and to develop systems that are appropriate to the values of the future. So um, there is an institutional drag, and there's a demand in some sense for for real creativity and in the human realm to come up with economic systems, for instance, that are not based on growth and measured by GDP, but economic systems that are measured by the well-being of people and the well-being of the planet. And, and we haven't invented those yet. We're in the process. Yeah, it, it does seem to me that G GDP is a, is a very unfortunately well-established measure of progress and, and, and it's, you know, but, but yet it's so clearly flawed. It, it simply measures the business of an economy, not, not really the right outputs in any way, shape or form. And it's based on, on limitless growth and we can't do that. We're up against the limits of the, of the planet. Um, and so um, we, at a certain point, we have to stop sort of, except that we're not growing materially and the, to measure our growth in terms of well-being. So do you, do you think it's along with Epoch B, you know, there would be essentially a transition to a sort of post-growth or, or a, a very different paradigm of, of what in fact society's purpose or goals are? I, I very much think that. And I think that, you know, Epic B in a sense is a transition to um, a post-growth world. Um, and ideally a post-scarcity world that, um, that is, is based on entirely different principles. Um, I th and, and looking into the future and when we're at population equilibrium and potentially at a kind of material equilibrium, then um, many, many different things will change um, and, and, and will have to change. I'll throw in something just that, that throughout, one of the reasons that gives me hope in this respect is throughout our historical evolutionary past, we had many societies that were not based on constant growth. They were based in equilibrium and they had social, economic, family systems that were based on a more egalitarian and more um, sharing societies and, and also societies operating in concert with nature rather than against nature. So that we have a whole aspect to our beings where we actually know how to adapt to conditions of equilibrium. Um, we've just gone through this dizzying period of, of, of growth historically. And um, what we're looking toward in the future is being bringing back that aspect of, of ourselves in um, not in a hunter-gatherer world, but in a, in a technological world with 10 to 12 billion people. So, um, uh, Jonathan, do you, th do you think that the human race is sleepwalking to a kind of hell on earth? Um, I guess the simple answer is we are headed in that direction. Um, and do I, th I so I, I think we're in, in deep danger of, of, doing exactly what you say, sleepwalking to a hell on earth and, and seeing that. I, do I think that ultimately that's really gonna be the outcome? I fear it sometimes, but I also have a basic um, faith and, and optimism. And I think this is one of the, the, the strengths of the book is it offers a vision of the future yep. that, that looks forward and says, we actually have the capacity to live on the earth using the global commons, using resources in such a way that not only benefits humanity can survive and other species, but that, that humanity can actually flourish. And so we're at a time where the demands of evolutionary survival 
are actually pushing us toward kind of the, the better parts of our nature. And so I, 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 I know that as, as biological creatures, as, as a species, we're capable of the behaviors and the values and the attitudes that are necessary to adapt to the conditions of the future. So I hold out, though I, many times I wake up in the morning and, you know, with despair and just think, you know, we're, we're, we're going to hell in a handbasket. Um, and there's no question there's a danger for that. I also know that, that there's a, a, you know, a growing awareness and a growing, you know, a, a groundswell of people who think differently and, and I think really stand a good chance of prevailing. I think we all hope, to hope so too. I, I think like like many of, of us, you know, we're we're at the same time super concerned. Um, you know, we see we perhaps see a dislocation or disconnection with some political leadership in terms of the their movement along the same pathway, and that there seems to be a big gap that's opening up in some places between what what leadership is doing and what governments are doing and what populations are. Sort of, we, we, we are thinking, um, especially yeah. the younger population, which which I think brings me neatly to another question. Do you, do you think in the future that, especially if we were to enter Epoch B or for the younger generation that have grown up in, in, in a slightly changing circumstances, as you said in the book, um, you know, since the 1980s, this, this type of generation, that they would actually seek to introduce retroactively perhaps laws which punish those who committed crimes knowingly mm. which have then you know which have then had impacts on their lives so it's it's a little like war crimes were invented in the second world war to punish those people who mm -hmm. can, you know new types of crimes were invented in order to punish those people who perpetrated them during the second world war and i and i i sort of wonder if the peril if that's a, if that's a possibility it may already be starting to happen uh, this push for 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 le legal act actions to 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 create incentives to change um I, what I certainly think is that um, going forward, that there's certainly room and space for that. Mm. Um, in terms of whether to do it retroactively in terms of crimes against humanity or crimes against nature, I think it depends, Constant. I think it depends on will that really serve us in, in any way going forward? Um, you know, I think the important thing is that our behaviors have to stop and change and 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 adapt, um, and if there's there's room for that, you know, for for those who willfully lie and cover up and cheat and exploit, um, on reflection, I think there's room for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's impossible. I think it'll be a very interesting evolution. You're beginning to see small cases of groups that are that are that are you know trying to go after these legal sort of incidents, and it's almost becoming a movement. I think this le legal action as as another route in which uh, you know environment the cause of environment could be moved forward. Um, so I think it's uh -huh. something some, something to watch uh, very much. So um, yeah. the 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 you know on the question of overpopulation you know, especially in the 70s i grew up in the 70s it was a very big topic uh, your book, original book came out in 1981 you know it, do you think overpopulation is being discussed enough today um no i, I think it's not i i think um i i think it's a it's a crucial problem but interestingly enough, the whole question of population is tied in with the very kinds of changes that we're talking about. Yeah. Because the population growth is slowing. And I think that that was a, one of the, the hallmarks of the book and my father's thinking was everybody was looking at the population exploding and just saying, what are we going to do? Yeah. And he said, look, it can't keep expanding. It's either going to collapse or it's going to bend and reach an equilibrium. And let's, let's look at that scenario. And in fact, that that's what being born out. That's what's being born out. But the really fascinating thing to me about the population situation is the things that cause people to have smaller families um, and therefore lower fertility and, and slow population growth are um, better socioeconomic conditions, yeah. um, better health, lowered infant mortality, and education and status of women. 
And in places where we advance those values, then population growth um, slows more quickly. So it's a really double win situation. If we don't look at trying to constrain other populations, but we look at, at trying to improve conditions in other parts of the world where population growth is still high, that's gonna be our most efficient and most ethical way of slowing population growth as, as soon as possible. Yeah, agreed. I, I think you know, different countries do seem to, look, looking at this inflection point on the sigmoid curve, it, uh -huh. it, seem, it seems as though the response of someone, let's say, for instance, in China would be different to someone in the USA or England or Nigeria. You know, d lots of diff different countries are very different points on this inflection curve, for, especially, as you said, for those socioeconomic reasons. Correct, um, correct. Mm -hmm. um, and... But I was just going to say that that in areas of the world where there has been development, they're they're on you know where we are at equilibrium or de declining in the Western world, um, and de but in in this much less developed parts of the world, um, they're just entering that slowing phase. So we are there is a disjuncture and, and, and a difference. Yeah, I think there's there's examples, you know, where I, I think it the population growth really seems to take off when when they start to countries start to develop economically and they they therefore have perhaps more more money flowing within the economy and they can they can feed feed more mouths but yet education systems haven't caught up and and as you said you know female rights for for workplace and so on is is lagging behind and that's that's where you get this big gap between between uh, those two uh, elements which are critical for population growth to to plateau mm -hmm. and and the education and status of women is, is essential yeah. because um, and because with education, they delay having their first child till, till later in life and also just have control over their reproductive life. Um, and um, and that, that makes a, a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen some good examples of that. Strangely enough, Iran went from the highest apparently fertility rate to, to within the shortest period of time. So it went from about seven uh, fertility rate to about two uh, in, in within, a, within a space of about 15 years. And that was mostly around that's, a very deliberate policy. Yeah, that's really something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it can be done. I, I think it's is the answer. And as you said, if if, if that yeah. was the, if that was the focus uh, for, for for development agencies, then perhaps that would be that would have a, a bigger influence on the on where this plateauing would would take place. Mm -hmm. The the win win situation that you described in the book, um, as we shift away from competition towards collaboration, you you know, when do you think this might happen, and what do you think could be the drivers? Um, I think, I think it can happen. I think it can happen sooner than we think. Um, so when that can happen, it, you know, it, it, there, there, there are things in place. I think one glaring current example has to do with the COVID epidemic, because we have been in a situation where we're acting in kind of a us them situation. Um, and so the, the, the Western countries are taking care of themselves, not taking sufficient care of what's happening in the developing world. That kind of selfishness is not going to work in the face of a COVID epidemic because the danger of, of developing new variants in places where the COVID rates are high then affects the rest of the world. So that if we can find a way to work together to provide vaccination and resources to areas of the world that don't have it, then that's a win-win. It helps those areas of the world, but it also helps us. Yep. And, yep. and I think that there's a growing awareness that in terms of distribution of wealth, um, in, in terms of the human condition, it's a real win-win situation. If we, I mean, you know, one starting statistic is that um, within, um, 80 or, or 100 years, 90% of the population will be in what's now the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and so we ignore that at, at our peril. Um, if conditions are, and, and the other real, real big example you know, has to do with migration. If, if conditions are not suitable for human beings in 
um, in ecologically deprived or economically deprived situations, then we have the, the, the problem of migration, um, which then it, you know, leads to just a tremendous fallout on all sides. Yeah, I, I think that's that's um, that's that's a you know climate induced induced migration, which could then potentially lead to conflict. I think is is something which which uh, you know people are underestimating perhaps. Um, and 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 if you looked at where that population growth is and where those those uh, hard to live, as you said, for either economic stress or ecological stress, that they, they become hard hard to actually inhabit anymore. Um, you know, they they're in regions of the world which are uh, touch points basically for conflict potentially in any case. Um, Absolutely. And and, there, and there's quite sort of scary scenarios that that can play out from that. So, in the uh, you know, as you said, in, you know, it's very much in in. I suppose the developed world's interest to to try and address both the issue of climate change, ecological breakdown, um, because otherwise they you know they may be facing uh, you know not only you know large scale conflicts within these regions, uh, potential uh, failed states, and and you know and, and migration all the way through to to their to their own territories. So I, it has struck me that. Some countries, including you know Russia and other countries, which have said you know we'll be fine, uh, you know in a way I think the Russian attitude or the government leadership attitude is to say we may actually benefit to some extent. Um, you know I think that's there's a good argument to say that's unrealistic if they have uh, you know tremendous numbers, millions of people on the move in their southern regions, then that's that's going to affect them just as much as as it is the 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 the, the countries involved. Yeah. And that's exactly right. It's 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 a scary possibility, and I and that was one of my questions. But in, in looking forward more positively to the future, you know, what does our relationship look like with the environment? You know, once if we were to enter this epoch B, um, very much to be the, the details are to be worked out, and that mm. that's the challenge of the coming generations, but were you know we would be looking at a at a society where um you know certainly with zero carbon em emissions um we'd be looking at um government and um social structures that are based around human welfare and not not around economic growth um and you know we would we would be looking at uh, new kinds of novel kinds of, of economic systems and political systems. Um, you know it's very much in your mission statement of your organization, but um, of working cooperatively cooperatively across the planet, in and and in, in terms of the relationship with nature, and in terms of the relationship with nature. Um, basically, figuring out the conditions of of uh, to placing value on the well-being and the condition of the planet and living within the planetary resources. Um, I, I, I think that, that that will be crucial. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, to some extent, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a zero sum equation. If, 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 you know, if, if limits, if the, if the absorptive capacity of the planet to, to, to for waste or for pollution is, is, is is already being breached, then then ultimately that's a constraint. Uh, so we either, you know, I, I think that we've, we've, we've gone beyond that point, uh, you know, especially with CO2 and with CO2 absorption, but also with many other forms of pollutants or waste that, that it's in excess of the planet's ability to absorb it or to process it. And, and you know, we're very much entering now the damaging phase um, where, the, where ecosystems are damaged, you know, with, with long-term long, long consequences. Um, you know, a future, as you said, you, we both have to look at look at this growth paradigm, the consumption paradigm, or also the nation state competitive paradigm, which is really driven with insecurity or defense defense considerations. Uh, that, uh -huh. that 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 that's that's a, that's a big driver. One can't help get the feeling that it's self it's self serving or self interested for governments to. To want to grow, um, if because if they want to grow, they have bigger tax takes, they have bigger budgets, they have big, bigger ability to spend more on guns and weapons, and, and this is this is all self-serving built within most of the government ways of thinking, and and that's going to be very hard, 
you know, in the long run, I suppose the only solution is some forms of demilitarized pacts, because you know, in the case of Europe, you know, you could argue that that was the post-war experience in 1945, 1940, 46, that, uh -huh. you know, it was only through economic and political integration and, and essentially creating a demilitarized zone or with a, with a overarching military pact that, that prevented this competitive uh, you know, issues that had led to the two world wars in the first place. So uh, on a global, if you think further and further ahead, then you have to consider that that ultimately will be necessary on a global basis. It will be necessary. And I think what what's significant is that in the period that we've come through, what we're calling Epic A, self-interest was best served by competitive, um, selfish, uh, in, accumulative behavior what's what's the, the reason we talk about a new reality is that if we're in a in a slowing growth world and heading toward equilibrium it's an actually an entirely different reality in which self-interest interestingly enough is served by um win-win solutions and by generosity and so the the kinds of changes that we need to make and the that we're all in favor of are not there just because they're they're idealistically or morally right. It really is a matter of survival. And self-interest being served by taking care of the planet and taking care of the rest of humanity is really what is going to be an aspect of, of a new reality that we're entering into. Yeah, it seems as though whenever the forces have exerted pressure on on civilization gatherings you, you know then, uh -huh. then 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 those societies have reorganized themselves to 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 function within that constraint so if you looked at i don't know the formulation of cities then the formulation of city states then the formulation of governments then the formulation of trading blocks like the eu you know they've organized themselves to be able to to to, to either deal with 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 constraints or pressures um, uh, you know, to function more more effectively, and, and I, I, you know, on a on a, on a now on a, on a macro scale, you know, we're we're facing this 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 same issue that unless we collaborate and find find ways to to administer, you know, our planet and our planet's resources in a way which is less destructive, which ultimately you know we have we have to do, that you know that there's a very strong incentive, in fact, to to try and address those 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 issues of governance and issues of responsibility that 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 you know folk kind of quite plainly need to be addressed and just weren't addressed up to this point they weren't addressed and i i think it's important to throw in that um that as human beings as human organisms in you know in terms of human nature we have the capacity for both selfish and cooperative behavior and um and which comes forward depends on which is most adaptive and most necessary for survival. But I think it's, you know, one aspect of it is part of what makes us human is not, not only our ability to talk and our ability to acquire and our ability to conquer nature. A lot of what, what has made us successful as a species has been our ability to operate as groups, to operate socially, and to use that to adapt to different environments. And just as you said, we have the capacity within us, I really believe, mm. to, make the, to make these adaptations. It really just is a question of whether we're gonna make them in time. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I agree And how much fallout there is or how much collateral damage there is in the meantime. Um, right. It, it strikes me that we may, we, it strikes me that the, uh, one possible outcome is that we, you know, we perhaps even find a way to resolve, um, you know, the carbon accumulation, perhaps even reverse the carbon accumulation mm -hmm. uh, to, to some extent. Te technically, it's very possible, even industrially, commercially, it's possible if you put a price on carbon that that could be that could happen in a matter of decades. Um, but, Correct. But, you know, whether we solve the biodiversity loss and general damage caused by human overexpansion, you know, in time, because that's a much more messy problem. It's a it's a much more hard to 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 frame problem um uh -huh. you know, that 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 you know you, you know i take examples of somewhere like england which is you know on the face of it a green and pleasant land but it but is in fact you know tremendously biodiversity 
uh, damaged or, or 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 set back. You know, if you if you were to look at it from three or four hundred years ago, it's it's had, you know, I think it's one. I think it actually came out in a list as top in terms of the amount of biodiversity that it, it had lost really? during it during its industrialization phase. And yeah. and and I, you know, we we sit there in England, you don't really notice it. You think it's it's fine, but of course, there's there's just been everything's been pushed to the side. You know, so much flora and fauna has been marginalized. That, that we're actually in an, in quite an impoverished environment, although we we don't notice it. But I suppose if you look at that on a on a larger scale, um, you know that that that's also what's happening. So maybe the big the big loser is going to be nature and biodiversity. Yeah, and I I will confess, I mean that that is the in a sense the biggest tragedy and the biggest concern because that's just irrevocable. That yep. there's a you know we're looking at a lot of things that can be can be controlled and 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 reclaimed. Um, but the loss of that legacy and the loss of that diversity and the effects that it will have, you know, for all species is just tragic. I agree. In this case, it brings the, the question of this intergenerational, um, you know, uh, equity, uh, you know, the, the, what, uh, we're do, what we're doing today is, is essentially stealing from future generations. It's, it's harming, harming their ability to enjoy a life of the same qualities and diversity that, that we may have enjoyed. And, and you know, one of my questions is a little bit off, off, off topic, but it relates to this question of how, how governments and democracies, uh, in particular, but governments generally, you know, can instill, bring in, bring on board long-term thinking, long-term policy making, you know, when they're subject to to short-term election cycles, or that you know that, that they 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 don't built that way. You know that the governments are built to think on four year cycles, possibly even one more election cycle beyond that. Uh, and yet, so much policy that they enact, you know, will affect uh, multiple generations to come. Yeah, and it's uh, you you stated it very well, and it's a, it's a dilemma and a and a problem. Um, and the 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 way through it or the way around it really has to do with long-term thinking um, and, uh, and, and systemic change. Um, and we, I, I don't have an immediate solution to it, but the, the I, I think the, the best I can say is that in the conditions that we are now, unlike how things were for many centuries, um, the long-term thinking is actually necessary and for our survival. Um, and that we actually need to incorporate somehow in our political systems that view and that, that longer term. And I, you know, I don't know how much the younger generation can do with that, but I think that that's our responsibility in our generation. Yeah, to introduce as much long-term thinking as possible. Yep, I I, I agree. The cost equation seems seems quite a simple equation. If you look at the costs of actions today for the future, that that maths yeah. math, math seems to be becoming more and more stark, uh, and, and in uh -huh. a way in a way which should should drive uh, slightly longer-term planning. You know, to to be to make sense just even today. So. I, I do hope that those drivers are, are now, and there has, does seem to have been a very big shift in the last five to ten years, um, which which I think is becoming more prevalent. Uh, not, yeah. Not a, yeah. And and I just to say one of the one of the things that we hope to introduce with the book is to give a model, to give an image, to give a metaphor for for looking at things from the long term, because um, it just putting putting in the context of the long term both allows us for more wisdom in making choices for the future, but also puts our current, you know, five to 10 year cycle into a broader evolutionary um, and historical and developmental context. Yeah. Um, and specifically what I mean by that is, if we stand back and look at things over a range of 100, 200 years, much less thousands of years, we're at a, really at a, at a critical and a, and a, and a, a unique point in history. And there, if we look at it in the short term, everything just looks totally confused and, and in total conflict and there's no way out. But if you look back in the context of the curve, there is a way out and that's looking forward to what we're calling Epic B, looking forward to 
um, adapting to a future that is is in equilibrium as opposed to growing. Yeah, yeah. On the very last page of the book, there's there's a rather beautiful sentence which I I just found um uh, because it actually it's even beyond the acknowledgements and it's beyond the uh the notes uh and it's just the last printed page in the book in which you you state the course of epochal change is not predetermined it is subject to our influence i, I suppose Correct. it's it's it, it, it's down to us and, and to to this generation uh to, to to take that action very much so and to, to take that action and to understand that there are many different ways and many different perspectives in order to, to, to address this and, and to take action because it making the transition to an adaptive world, it involves not only, it involves individual change, it involves community change, it involves changes in childcare practices, it involves a different kind of work, it involves different social and political and economic institutions, different kinds of, of international relations and a different ecological relationship with the planet. So there's there's room for intervention at all those levels. Yep. And so we we all can be very much part of this change. Yeah, I think I think that's a very important point is that practically all jobs will change. So it it it's, uh -huh. it, it, it's not that if you're a, a dentist or a plumber or a uh, a surgeon or a designer that 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 the what is coming is going to is going to affect you or that you can actually make a positive change in the area you know as you said a whole range practically everything will will, will need some form of adaptation change uh, hopefully for the better so everyone can take part in that everyone can take part in that and we often one of my personal perspectives on this is that we often look at the broader the systemic the social and political and the economic but where this change really takes place and where the where in a sense the the rubber hits the road actually has to do with it with childhood development and actually has to do with the early childhood experiences of um being attached being secure um and that sets you up for a different kind of worldview uh, and so that the 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 better the infant and early childhood education incorporates these values and the better the care is, then we've got human beings who can then adapt and have it within their, within their DNA, within mm -hmm. themselves to operate cooperatively, to understand um, use of the, uh, of, of the commons and to understand that there's, there's common good. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, in one last question, uh, the, you say that the demands of human converge, human of demands of survival, sorry, converge with the higher ideals of humankind and the well-being and flourishing of human society. It is up to us to navigate this transition, adapting to and emerging in a new reality. It seems that we don't know where we're going, but there's a, it's a rather uncertain time. And do, do you think this is an exciting time to be alive? And do you think that humans will find their way to a sustainable future? I do. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a tremendously exciting time to be alive. Um, we are faced with a challenge, a set of challenges that are um, unique in, in our history and our evolution. And, you know, I, I think that that as discouraging against things may be, I think that it's, it's, a, almost exhilarating and if people can look at it in, in 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 that context then i think that there's hope for the future yeah yeah i agreed thank you so much jonathan it's it's been an absolute pleasure to to speak to you today and thank thank you for your forbearance uh and and it's it, you know for arranging your, your this time we, i really appreciate it and i hope that we'll get a chance to speak soon uh, i do do want to recommend to everyone uh, the book uh, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, was published uh, I think just very recently uh, and it's a new reality human evolution for a sustainable future and I recommend it to to all of our followers um, thank you it was really a pleasure to have the conversation thank you very much